All right, so to kick us off for today's event, um, one of the things that we decided we wanted to do a while ago was to hear kind of some success stories of Agile in the Utah community. And so uh, Rebecca Fortune and Christiane are here today to kind of share their story. And we're going to do this in a um, kind of fireside chat, question and answer um, format. So we did ask for questions. We got one submission. We have some questions we're gonna start with. If you have questions uh, throughout the presentation, please put them into the chat. Um, Steve is going to help kind of call those out as they come up. So um, certainly if you have questions that come up, feel free to put those in. Um, I will be moderating the discussion and um, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca first to introduce herself. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. So awesome. Rebecca, so do you wanna go ahead and start us off? I will. First of all, thank you for uh, having Christiane and, and me today. We were super excited to join this community. Um, again, my name is uh, Rebecca Fortune, or you can call me Becky. Uh, I've actually been with Zions now for about a year and a half. Um, I'm, I'm just recently moved here from uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I have about uh, 28 years uh, supporting financial services organizations. Um, in software development and information technology. Uh, about uh, 20 of those years have been uh, learning agile practices. Um, I'll date myself going back to RUP, <laughs> Unified Processes. Um, and uh, specifically the last six years focused in on supporting uh, uh, banking organizations with business agility. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm loving Utah, great, great uh, uh, place to be and, and, and love working with uh, Zions. Christiane, what about you? Oh, thanks so much for having me and I'm excited to be here with you all. Uh, like Becky, I am a transplant to the Utah tech community and, and very grateful to be here. I uh, started working with Zions Bancorp about five years ago, first as a consultant, and then I joined the company as their director of banking transformation about three years ago uh, and, and ended up moving to Salt Lake City at that time. I previously based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, so moved from Silicon Valley to Silicon Slopes, but uh, I spent most of my career in financial services, and so um, for most of the industry on those traditional sort of banks and insurance companies and other big uh, big FS providers, they were slow adopters of Agile. Uh, so I smile, Becky, when you talk about RUP because you know we got to iteration and RUP and uh, we had a term called architecture-driven Agile um, often, but um, uh, you know we're sort of later adopters in many cases. And so I've been on an Agile, <clears throat> progressively Agile journey here. Uh, for my career, I spent most of my time helping financial services retool their businesses uh, to better leverage technology. And so um, for the last five years with Zions, we've been in the middle of a giant core transformation. And uh, if you talk about scaled agile, it's about as big as you can possibly go <laughs> from a scale perspective. Uh, so it's a, a massive um, collection of systems that support all of our our back end, about 75% of our, uh, our employees touch these systems. We have $30 billion a month, uh, excuse me, 30 billion a week in transactions that flow through these. And so um, it's, it's kind of like changing out uh, the engines of an airplane while the, the plane is in the air is the analogy that it's often been driven to. So we've got about 700 people working on this core transformation and, and I'm thankful to have uh, Becky as my partner in our Agile COE and share the journey with all of you. Great. Thank you so much for both being here. This is um, this is really exciting. So uh, Becky, starting with you, why don't you share with us kind of the current environment, um, the current Agile environment? Sure. So um, within Zions and in, in our uh, information technology space specifically, I would say we have anywhere from uh, 140 to 150 teams. Um, again, this is across all uh, uh, 
aspects of our, our technology department. Um, in terms of Agile specifically, we have about 48% uh, of those teams that are leveraging uh, some Agile methodology in their day-to-day -day work. And, and that translates to about 64% um, of our technology investment. So um, we, we are way on our journey to uh, implementing Agile, obviously more broadly across the organization, but that's about where we sit right now. And, and that really highlights, you know, a lot of our, our strategic initiatives within the organization has really uh, leaned in and in, in leveraging uh, Agile for these um, high visible and, and especially like as, as Christiane mentioned, some of our, our, our core strategic uh, initiatives. You wanna add anything to that, Christiane? You got it. <laughs> so that, so, Hundred? How many teams did you mention? 100? It's about it. It's uh, I'm I'm roughly guessing it's about 140 to 150 teams. So almost half of our our teams are are working in some sort of construct of agile. So what I mean by that is either you know they they may be like an individual uh, scrum team or a kanban team, or uh, they're leveraging a team of teams construct. Okay. Um. When you think about these teams, how are you, how are you ensuring kind of consistency? Um, you know, and I obviously understand that not every team is going to be doing things the exact same, but how are you tying everyone together? I mean, that's, that's a lot of people, like, how do you keep Agile fresh and how do you kind of continue to share learnings with, with that many people? Well, um, the company is also, and, and I failed to mention this in my intro, but the company has really invested uh, in Agile, you know, not only from a learning and training perspective in terms of, of uh, the methods and, and frameworks, but um, I actually lead the uh, Agile Center of Excellence within our organization. So um, I have the coaching competency, the training competency. So you know, through, uh, through our Agile coaching and communities of practice, uh, you know, that's where we maintain, uh, you know, continuity. We've uh, written standards, you know, that, that our teams can um, access. So, you know, every team is on a different journey. And so, you know, having that, that, that continuity with a centralized uh, um, Agile support, um, you know, help, helps that. As well as, I mean, with the various roles, again, with the communities of practice and folks coming in to get together, you know, it's it's not only the Agile COE is is leading that and 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 having those standards, but also our community is really coming together and and helping to shape where we're going uh, in terms of their their learning and and you know practical experience. Okay, you know, Becky, great. I if you don't mind, if I could just build on that. Absolutely. Kelly, you mentioned consistency and that's actually been a key learning point for us and a key point of inflection as we go through our journey. And specifically it's learning where you need to be consistent and building that, but not worrying about consistency where you don't need it, right? I mean, we wanna empower the teams um, and, and the context is different in different places, but then we've also found in some cases with our Agile transition that we haven't always had the right balance uh, where we do have teams that work together in highly integrated ways. There were places that they have to be consistent or, you know, everyone's expected to know five different processes or five different standards, whatever that is, and it really holds them back. And so being very thoughtful and understanding where do we need that, right? Where do we need those joins, <laughs> uh, so to speak? And where can we, you know, where do we not have to worry about it? And so that's something I think is constantly evolving for us. And it's a little bit different, uh, you know, in different contexts, um, even across the company around, you know, some teams are a little bit more like the wild, wild west. And then there's other places where I, I've got a team, this core transformation I mentioned, we have 35 Agile teams working together over six Agile release trains. 
to create our solution and we have to put more consistency there so that those teams can operate in, you know, in a more cohesive framework. Um, so it's just, it's kind of those points of inflection, right? Of where do you need that and learning where do you not? Exactly. Okay. Okay, so there's, we have a, a, there's a few questions coming in through the chat that are relevant here. Would it be okay, okay. to yeah, go insert for it. those? There's, a, there's one from Brianna that's, uh, you know, are teams choosing to adopt Agile or is more like forced on them? Or, you know, you, you, know, what, the, you know what the question is. <laughs> Becky, do you want to take that one first or do you want me to start? Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, you raise a really good point. I mean, you know, every team is is on their own journey and you have to really meet them where they're at. Um, a lot of teams want to leverage these practices. I mean, granted, there's going to be people that uh, are not always on board. You you don't necessarily always have 100%. But, but what I'm seeing is that once teams get in there and, and, and really learn and see the value and the benefit and the collaboration. And, and you know, as Christiane mentioned that, um, you know, they have this autonomy to some degree to work. They're really embracing and adopting this. So um, I, I wouldn't say that it's forced upon them, uh, but definitely, you know, it is a strategic direction for the organization. And and so, you know, there's there's a little bit of give and take there. But my experience with Zions has been the teams want to do this. They they like the collaboration. They they like the visibility and the transparency of the work and the opportunity to broaden and expand their skills. So, um, you know, I, I don't I don't see it as anything forced, but rather very collaborative and, and, and team effort. We actually found it was a big way, um, it was a big retention boost on my team. So we actually were operating under more waterfall constructs up until 2019. And as we completed a major milestone of our transformation, we were looking at sort of the journey ahead. We made a strategic decision that we would pivot that major initiative to, um, to an agile methodology and it's still sort of hybrid agile waterfall. I won't pretend we're perfect here, um, but that that decision it was made for a few reasons. But the way the team reacted, we were already doing things like Scrum um, and adopting a lot of agile principles, but we were scrumming in waterfall, right? <laughs> I mean, it was um, uh, so we got a lot more a lot of credit maybe that we for being more agile than we probably were, but um, it really energized the teams. And in fact, we knew our, we couldn't keep our workforce um, focused on something like this, operating under a waterfall uh, regime for years. And then we have this, you know, three or four hundred of our best people across the company and uh, we haven't brought them along with us in terms of this transition to Agile. And so for them to feel like they were on the forefront of the company's transformation, building their skills, right, and, and learning something new because many of them hadn't really had, um, had that exposure before or maybe it was very limited, uh, that was is significant in terms of the way our employees reacted. And I think what it's done in terms of retention, it's, it, you know, it's tough to keep people focused on something for, this will be 10 years when we're done. Uh, and it's sort of this latest phase. We've been working on it for uh, for about two and a half. And so um, it's been monumental uh, from that regard. There was, and then there was one other follow-up question to when you were talk, talking about the uh, standards. Yeah. And so, so Eliza was wondering, is there an example or two of, of standards just to give some context around that concept? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and, and I appreciate the, uh, uh, you asking it. I, being in a very highly regulated environment, and, and I think, Christiane, you touched on this, is that you, you have to strike a balance. You absolutely have to strike a balance because regulators will come in and, and want you to demonstrate, are you doing what you say that you're going to do? Where I have found that uh, standards really uh, apply, not, not only in our processes, of course, but really around, you know, reporting and measures. Um, that's where I feel like it's a little tighter. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you want to, to, to be able to communicate progress in a, in a, um, uh, uh, 
a common way, if you will, and, and for our leaders to understand that, uh, you, you know, having those um, standards around our uh, agile life, uh, uh, life cycle management tool. So we're using Azure DevOps internally. And so, you know, how we set up our backlogs and, and, and how, you know, at each level, if you will, of, of our teams or our teams of teams and, and creating dashboards and, and what are our measures? What are we looking at in, in, in order to communicate uh, progress effectively, you know, for, for folks to really understand what you're doing and, and us to, uh, to be able to speak a common language, that's very, very important. Um, and, and other standards examples would be, um, you, you know, uh, documenting our, our requirements or our user stories, if you will, in a consistent fashion to ensure that, you know, there's that we're describing them well, we have acceptance criteria. So, you know, those are just a, a few examples of, again, you know, you, you when you're in a regulated environment, you you have to have some guardrails there that our teams can operate uh, within, and and you know ensure that you're managing risk effectively. Two big, I I just I'll put extra votes against two big ones that Becky mentioned, which is around how we structure some of the work, especially within our tool, um, especially so that teams that have interdependencies on each other because that does exist, especially in a. The core system we're launching has got 90 different systems that integrate together. Um, uh, the other thing around kind of, you talked about stories and whatnot, but, you know, definition of done for us was big yeah. and having some stand, and that's actually a, a more recent learning point is getting a little bit tighter across our teams on definition of done and ready um, because we do have uh, so much cross team collaboration still as we start to put the whole, uh, all of the components together. And especially when the automation around testing and, and ensuring that we're um, keeping our non-functional requirements into perspective. So yeah, those are great points, Christiane. There's some good questions coming in. Um, I know. <laughs> I really I really like this one from um, Brianna or Brianna, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. Um, what have been some of the biggest challenges as you've been kind of getting everyone to adopt Agile. Why don't you kick us off, Christiane, on that one? Yeah, where to start? Um, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, a few that come to mind. Um, one is finding the right balance around Agile principles and behaviors. I think there can be um, a tendency to be really good students of Agile rules and mechanics and they can result in anti-patterns, right? And so um, we see our teams sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll take one agile principle and they maybe take it out of context, right? <laughs> and use it, almost weaponize it. Um, and so we've really tried to focus around the why, what are some of the outcomes we're trying to achieve and then focus more on behaviors around agility versus a really um, dogmatic approach to a particular methodology. Um, so I think that's been one. Some teams totally get it. There's others that are really good at doing agile without really being agile. And so that's, that's you know, that takes a long time uh, if you're not. And then we have some of our teams that are never to, you know, practice agile formally, um, but are some of the most agile thinkers that we have. Right, and so is sort of recognizing those wins. Um, the other thing for note for us, and Becky touched on this, is we're a highly regulated industry, and um, there's a lot of executive visibility to some of these things. And so, actually, training our the people that watch us, <laughs> whether they're executives or compliance type people, audit, risk folks, or regulators, bringing them along and kind of doing the education there and finding the right balance of what are the right, how do we communicate to our teams and within our teams from a management perspective versus how do we maybe translate some of that to the watchers is, and the people that really want to help us, right, but they don't always know how to help us because it's different, right, and it's something that the company is learning overall, and so I think those have been two areas that, um, that we spend a lot of energy on, and they're needed. It's just part of that, part of that journey. I have a question for, yeah. I was just going to say really quickly, so these questions coming in are amazing, so 
we can stick with the questions coming in or we can flip back and forth to the script. I just, I love these questions. So I just want to ask you ladies. Okay. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Did you want to add anything, Becky, before I look to the questions coming in? I mean, really the only thing that I it just really struck me, Christiane, and what you said is, is, you know, is progress over perfection. And, and sometimes it's very, very difficult, you know, it, it's just, and, and, and I'm sure we'll get to this in another question, but, you know, just being patient because some, you know, folks really want to be black and white with the, the, the methods and the framework. And, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work where they're at in their journey. And, and so, you know, that's, that's been something that I've learned over the course of, of my personal journey is just, you know, you, we, we take this very iteratively and we learn and we're patient with ourselves and, and, you know, I mean, we still have to deliver, you know, there's no question about that, but, um, you, you know, we don't have to be perfect in, in kind of the letter of the law. Um, so Steve, I don't know if you've been looking through the chat, I'm trying to maybe summarize a couple questions into one. Um, there's one about dependencies, right? And I think everybody deals with dependencies. And of course, you know, the saying goes, just eliminate your dependencies. Well, that's not always possible. So um, JW Spengler is asking, are you able to utilize traditional scrum teams or because of those of those dependencies, are you having to do something different to manage all those? You wanna take that one, Christiana? I know that one's near and dear to you. Yeah, I'll start there. I mean, we have some teams that really are, they're fairly self-contained. Um, and then there's some teams that are on the other end of the spectrum, they really do have quite a bit of external dependency and it's because they're working with, um, you know, Becky talked about, we have 140 teams that have moved to Agile, but we also have teams that haven't, right? That are supporting legacy applications. And so they've got to work with those folks. And then there's kind of folks in the middle where we try to keep them as contained as possible, but there's, there's no way I've found that's possible to perfectly draw the boundaries around any one size team because of the size of what we're doing is so large in, in the way that it integrates. And so, um, our teams are focused around components, but then eventually those components have to integrate with one another. And so that's really where we have, um, we have challenges. Where we've gotten better about addressing that is uh, collaboration, right? And uh, I was just reading a, we do a quarterly staff survey and I was reading some of the comments today, you know, one of them hit the nail on the head in their comment. They said, I'm so glad we're focusing on collaboration. It's not cooperation, right? Often I think teams would say, okay, you need this. So I'm just going to make it work. But actual collaboration of there's some negotiation there and conversation or how do we achieve our, our shared outcomes? Um, so a lot of that, and then we, we did have to leverage standards around how we structure our work to be able to map out those inner team dependencies. So we spend more time than we would like to in our tool, doing some of that linking so that teams can see, okay, in, in two PIs, I'm going to get this other component ready so we know that we can actually test it all the way through. Um, and so that's sort of how we, it's not perfect, but I'd, I'd actually love to learn from others how they're solving that, but that's how we've solved for it is with tooling and unfortunately just a little bit more orchestration uh, just simply due to the sheer size of what we're building. And, and Christiane, I'll add to that in, in the collaboration is that, I mean, we, we also leverage it as an opportunity for continuous improvement. So, um, you know, I, I, I recall Christiane, a conversation that we had a couple of months ago where mm -hmm. we, you know, Future Core had a, a huge dependency with another group. And so we take that as an opportunity to reflect to see, you know, how can we get better? Um, a, a particular example that's coming to mind is that uh, we had a data team that was very critical in helping to deliver some capabilities that that uh, Christiane and her team needed. And so as we examined that and we, we saw that, you know, it was just an opportunity to say, hey, let's take these particular skill sets and bring them over and, and work 
you know, uh, even more closely with the future core team and, and become a part of their planning and uh, initiatives yeah. and, and, and help, you know, build one backlog that that team could work on. So, you know, it's not perfect. It, it's, you know, we, we're always finding new challenges given the technology, but, um, you know, we never, or, or we attempt to not miss an opportunity to uh, improve and reflect on that and see, you know, how can we make this easier for our development teams to deliver? I mean, that's a question that we always attempt to orient ourselves back to is, you know, are there things that we can do to improve this? And, and you're, you're absolutely correct, Kelly, you, you can't get rid of dependencies, but you can certainly put the attention and time to minimize them uh, as much as possible. And, and, and that's, that is an ongoing uh, uh, discussion and learning, I, I believe, within our organization. Great, thank you. Steve, did you have something from yeah, the chat? These, these questions coming in are good. Let me, let me uh, ask this one from Dave, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to it a little bit. So he, he asked, how much have you had to re-architect your systems and restructure your teams to increase the agility of the organization? Now you've started to answer that already. And so I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit uh, too. Uh, is there more you think you might need to do or ought to do or could do to restructure or that, that would be required to become truly more agile and lean in what you're trying to do? Um, what, what have you seen there? Christiane, why don't you start on that one? Uh, given your experience in that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, yes, the answer is yes, Steve, yeah. Dave. I mean, um, and I suspect we'll always be evolving. I don't know that there's a fixed end state, right? So as sort of evolution is the, 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 the normal. Um, what we are trying to build is a more of a services-based architecture that will actually allow us to, supported by a robust CI CD pipeline, that'll allow us to really, <laughs> really be agile. And so we kind of, we call that our digital backbone or digital to the core is our strategy. And so the challenge is sort of getting there. And I'm sure when we get there, they'll, like I said, there'll be this next thing. But right now, 75% of our system integrations are batch based for example, right? And so when we talk about these interdependencies, for I have to do 300 business functions uh, going through a batch system that processes overnight, that's you know something that happens on a mainframe. So that's what we're replacing and we're building is this modern real-time services-based core and infrastructure. Um, so getting that foundation in place will wildly unlock things. And then we've got transformation in parallel around how our teams are structured that um, I think Becky ought to talk about around uh, our, our lean portfolio management discipline yeah. um, that I think is sort of the business orientation. So we have sort of a technology foundation, but then the business alignment really to support that. And so really need both of those, um, but it's a, it's a real evolution. Yeah, and that's, what, that's exactly what I wanted to touch on, Christiane, is, is uh, really aligning ourselves to our, our, our value. Um, our customer segments. So, you know, as we as we are venturing into 2021, that's really um, uh, an area of focus for us is uh, restructuring how we are doing our work, and specifically, uh, you know, aligning our our portfolios, if you will, um, around our customer segments, and and looking at you know how how do we deliver value to the customer, and and how do we structure our teams around that, that value delivery. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys have, have um, you know, heard that notion and, and moving from project to product and, 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 and that construct, uh, but that's, that's really an area that we're, we're focused on and, and, and ensuring that, you know, we're, we're working on the things that really help us move the needle to strategy. So, you know, you can imagine that work is, it flows from so many different places within the organization. And so, you know, seeing the value that we've seen with some of our, uh, uh, you know, high profile, high visible uh, initiatives, it's just really expanding that further into the business and, 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 and taking that customer centric uh, uh, approach. 
You're asking those questions right now, how to, how you might structure around the products and the customers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and, and the benefit, I mean, are, are, you know, that's really resonating because, you know, when you, you want to deliver value for that customer, uh, having that focus, um, you know, not only at the top, but all the way down to our teams is, it's just an imperative. Well, here's a, here's another one from the chat, if I could, Kelly. Yeah. Has, uh, this is from, uh, da, 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 was it Brianna? Brianna, we're still wondering if we're pronouncing that correctly. But has the, has the transformation been limited to, to the financial technology uh, space or has it been adopted by other functions or, you know, of the organization where, you know, legal, HR, marketing, uh, uh, financing, projects, things like that. Uh, what is, what's, the, what's the depth, what's the reach uh, that you're seeing there? Well, from, from my perspective, I mean, it's, we're definitely uh, partnering with uh, these organizations in the opportunity, uh, in, in the organ, we are partnering with these folks in our organization. So, you know, as we think about, as the example I just gave around portfolios, that uh, definitely, you know, you have to take a spe step back and say, how am I funding, you know, if I've, I've been in this mode of, of doing yearly budgeting cycles and I've been funding projects, how does this change how I'm going to, you know, fund work going forward? So you, finance is, is very, very involved in that. Um, HR is very involved as well. You know, uh, Christian touched on, uh, you know, retention with our employees and, and thinking about our workforce of the future. One, one of the initiatives that uh, we um, uh, implemented uh, last year was really looking at, okay, what are all the roles that, that we have in this space and uh, beginning to uh, introduce those, you know, the, the job classes that aligns with those roles. So HR has been a critical partner uh, in that, in, in how we think about, you know, uh, performance and um, marketing, I, you know, as we've, as we've rolled out uh, different capabilities to, um, you know, the various branches and, and our banks, um, you know, marketing and, and our organizational readiness partners. So, um, you know, there's, there's always opportunities. Again, you know, we're, we're still on, on newly in this journey from, uh, in, you know, bringing them along even more is, is it's, it's just an ongoing process, just like it is with our, our technology teams. Is there a, is there a part of the organization that's not quite connected to what's going on that you're like, okay, that, that part of the organization is where we need to get them on board to help out more. Or what do you think, Christian? Yeah. You know, I, do, um, I think people want to figure out how to be a part of this. I think it yeah. started that way. And Steve, I would have said 18 months ago, I could have given you a list. Yeah. Uh, I think we've, there's a question in here about, are you getting executive buy-in? And the answer is yes. And in fact, 2020, if there was a theme for 2020, it was agility, yeah. right? And the need to be able to respond more quickly and in real time. And so the, um, the way that teams who were operating under agile constructs were able to demonstrate the value of agility to supporting the crazy year that was 2020, we had a number of business opportunities come up, but then also just all of the pivot um, to, to just changing how we did business. There was real visibility to that. And so I think with, with that combined with just some of the other natural benefits we're seeing around improvements to quality and value delivered, our executive teams and others are really starting to see it. And so the question is not, it's not like, should we do this? Should we be agile? It's about how how can we support? How do we plug in? What does this look like for us? So, um, Becky, you might. You no, might. I think that's great. I mean, I you know, as you were as you were speaking, I was reflecting on. I mean, it's it's constant. Teams are reaching out and saying, "Hey, come and talk to our organization." You know, uh, I, operations group. We we just recently. Um, did some foundational trainings and discussion with them. They, they're like, oh, we're working with this different group and they're using all this new language and, you know, we want to understand it more. So the excitement is there, you know, and, and now they're, they're pulling on us to come in and, and have that conversation. Uh, and, you know, Christiane, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I think about, 
you know, just a, a phenomenal example that that we've seen in in, in this past year is, uh, you know, with the the PPP loans and and just how quickly our teams had to come together and, and adjust to that. Even the resiliency of our our employees to, you, you know, I think of Future Core and, and and Christian, your group, how big it is, and you know how we had to shift to we're all virtual and we all have to plan. You know, you want to keep your business going um, as it was before. And so, you know, it, it's just the, the teams have really, really demonstrated and, and just embraced. Kelly, you'd mentioned earlier that, you know, virtual has put us on this level playing field. I, as, as an agilist, you know, I was reflecting, kind of geeking out actually of, you know, we, in our Agile Manifesto, it's it's face-to-face -face conversation. There's something to be said for what we've learned uh, just being in this virtual environment and what we can, you know, continue to um, adopt and, and leverage in our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, as, as, as we move forward and come back together in the office. Um, but it's been great. I mean, it, it's, the, the 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 employees are really embracing this and and you know we're having a lot of good results the you know the face to face conversation one that is so about 30% of my team is uh, offshore either in uruguay or india and we so that's an area where okay we figure out what is the overlap what does the mechanism look like i'm sure many of you have similar challenges um, but we always got pushback and it was around this, we talked about being overly dogmatic on some of the agile principles and it, people would get hung up on, well, it's a face-to-face -face conversation. Well, hey, face-to-face -face can be what we're all doing right here, right now, right? On exactly. a video. It doesn't need yeah. to be that we're co-located sitting next to each other. And so the getting past some of that and realizing some of the mental boxes we put ourselves in um i think has been monumental in terms of opening up the talent pool where we can get folks and then um we've got people all over the state of utah right not just in salt lake and then all over the country i've got employees in 31 states and wow. they're all working on something that's headquartered out of salt lake right as well as uh three other countries so um you know i think just getting getting past some of those hurdles is uh, really monumental so speaking about people, we have about 10 minutes left. How are you preparing um, not only your practitioners, but your leaders as well? Like, how are you preparing them to kind of move forward in the Agile frontier at Zions? Well, from an Agile COE perspective, I, you know, the, the training has just been critical. Um, you know, again, thinking about where they, where, where are these teams within their journeys? What are they doing? You know, so applying the right training at the right time, uh, so that they can, you know, begin to practice and build muscles that, that is an approach that, you, you know, we really put a lot of thought to, um, because again, you know, you, you want to start with those foundations and, and, uh, build upon that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, communities of practice, uh, just bringing, um, you know, people together, not, not only in their roles, but even in safe spaces to have conversation about, you know, what are they learning? What are they observing? Um, what are those, the, the, the areas where we can improve? Um, so, you know, support groups, if you will, and, and mentoring. Uh, uh, I, I know that as we've, uh, introduce new practices to some of our teams, we'll connect them with other folks. So, you know, Christian has several uh, uh, program managers or, or release train engineers within her group. And they've been awesome that you can just pull on them and say, hey, you know, we, we have this team that is, has just started. Do you mind sharing some of your best practices for getting prepared for a planning event or, um, you know, risk management? Uh, uh, visibility or, you know, whatever the topic is. So, you know, a buddy system, a community of practice, uh, training, uh, we really, really lean in on um, our inspect and adapt and reflecting, you know, and even making our continuous improvement items just as visible as the work that our teams are, are working on. You have any others, Christian, that you've seen? I know you guys, you, 
Christian is awesome in focusing on supporting her leadership. So, you know, my biggest thing is I want to make sure that we have uh, not only we deliver what we need to deliver, but that our, so our entire executive team actually joins like a monthly stakeholder call. That's how important yeah. some of these initiatives are. So how do we communicate to them? And they all want to help. And I think sometimes it's this foreign language of agile. So how, how do we empower them with the right information and the right visibility so that they can help us? And so metrics are a focus and sort of winnowing in on what are those key things, right? So whether it's blockers, whether it's some of these systemic things that they can just look at from a different lens. And so that's where we've been focused on not overwhelming with maybe too many data points, but really sort of simple around team performance, velocity. Um, we, ha we do have some significant commitments that we've even put out there in the market, right? So as a CEO or a CFO, you're thinking about that. So how can I put myself in their shoes anticipate the kinds of questions that they're going to ask and make sure that they're armed with that information because that comes back to then them helping us to be successful. So um, that's that's the other lens, right? When we look at kind of outside of our bubble of, of where we're really focused. And that, that, you know, struck a thought, Christian, is that, I mean, change management behind all of this is, is just so, so important. Um, you know, so especially as you look within your own organizations, uh, you know, take an opportunity to really say from a, a change perspective, what are we doing to help enable? Because you're absolutely correct, Christiane. If we walk in, I, I mean, I've learned this the hard way. You walk in and you start spouting a bunch of jargon, you're going to lose people. You, you really have to be thoughtful and methodical to, uh, you know, help folks make this switch. Kelly, if you don't mind, I'd be really curious. And we've talked about we're in our agile journey here, and we we're really proud of what we've accomplished. But we also know where we've got a, a journey ahead of us. And I would love to hear from this brain trust here if there are challenges we've shared. If anyone here is has found ways of overcoming them uh, to share with the group. Would yeah. That be all right? Yeah. I don't know um, if you just want to unmute yourself and share. Want to put it in the comments. I don't know if we had something come in. I saw some comments about, hey, we struggle with the same or uh, so I appreciate that we're in good company. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say plus one for JW Spangler and what he said. One of the one of our greatest things is to try to we have microservices, too. So we're trying to enable all of those teams um, with that capability. And that's what we're trying to do in our organization is say, where can we create these independent capabilities um, and reduce dependency? So nothing new, but um, you know, those are some of the, the issues that we're, that we're doing well in, I think microservices. And then we have a whole bunch of stuff that I'm really learning from, from the two of you. Um, and from the rest of the community on how to solve some of our issues, which are more on the governance and leadership side. So, thank you. Anybody else? You touched on mainframes. Mainframes is a beast of a problem, um, and uh, this is this this runs my organization as well. And it's a Fortune 100 company, and it's a you know it's excruciating. And, and it's sometimes getting, and, and you're talking to executives, why do we want to fix this problem? Just starting with the basic thing. It's something small, like we're trying to get off a green screen. Who's used a green screen? You know, they, they can remember, and some of them are so young, they, they don't even, yeah, yeah, we, uh, a good amount of the crowd has, but when we have some very, very young individuals, they don't actually know what that means, right? I mean, it's kind of conceptually they do, but starting with just like, like, let's build a very simple practice to help, you know, Get off the green screen. You know, I'll teach you how to use GitHub. I'll teach you how to do a pull request. I'll teach you how to move your repos, you know, your repositories into something, but just something very small without trying to focus on let's rewrite all the code. No, no, no it's stable. We've got other problems to solve, but it, really making sure that that like the problems we can solve are small enough to actually be achievable and we can be successful. And and when you look at like the overwhelming overwhelming scope of how we solve a mainframe problem, that it, just those basic small wins that it that's enough to motivate teams to want to be engaged and want to keep going instead of finding a hardcore agitator who's just like I want to keep developing on my system. 
That's great. Yeah, the more we can take it to business services and migrating those versus a big bang on a system conversion. I never want to do a system conversion again in my life. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like quite the adventure. <laughs> um, all right, so we have just a few minutes left. Uh, do you have any parting words or advice for, for us, the Utah Agile community, and things that you have found most beneficial as you've been on this Agile journey? Stay connected. You know, continue to build your network. Um, just like in the moment that we just had to, to hear from a couple of you, uh, it's so important to have somebody that you can reach out to and, and, you know, whether you're struggling with something at work or, you know, you're, you're wanting to jump to, uh, an, an, another organization or something like that. I mean, I think these relationships are so invaluable, um, for thinking and for learning, um, so that, for me, that has been something that I, I have embraced for, you know, the entire time that I've done this. I've, I've gone to a slew of conferences and I've met just tremendous people that, you know, I, I've kept in touch with uh, uh, for many, many years. And, you know, so, so having those relationships are so important and um, th that would be, you know, one key thing that I would say, just continue to uh, sharpen the saw there. What about you, Christiane? I, well, I love that. So I was just reflecting on that for a minute. So thank you, Becky. Um, I, you know, I'd add uh, two things. One is around fo just remaining focused on the principles themselves versus dogma of particular practices, right? Which I think yeah. can become a trap, but how do you how do you operate against the principles and make sure that our teams understand them and they're empowered. Um, part of that is sort of feeds into Mary and Teresa, your question here. Um, one of the big skills we see around, two of the big skills that we really see around being able to operate against those principles are empathy and communication. I serve on the, uh, the industry advisory board for the University of Utah's College of Engineering. So I can relate to, we look at their curricula as well. And one of the things we provide feedback on is it's often those soft skills, right? And the communication, you may have the most rock star developer, but uh, if he or she can't uh, you know, communicate, work well with others, um, act from a place of curiosity, right, and empathize with others, I, I think you're really limited. And so building those agile, those skills that support agile behavior and agile principles are really important. And, and obviously communication is sort of fundamental regardless, but often missing in technical curricula. Uh, and then the other thing I just leave is, you know, 2020 has been a tough year. And I think someone submitted this question in earlier, um, it's just understanding where our teams are at right now. And so for us, sometimes our teams are okay. Some days they're not, right? Some people are okay some days, some, some days they're not. It's just a tough time uh, rappling with, you know, everything going on in the world. And so I think just even just a little bit of acknowledgement and acceptance is really important right now that we're just in sort of an unprecedented time. And then it's okay to not be okay all yeah. of the time. Uh, and I mentioned that in an agile, you know, discussion simply because we encourage such openness and transparency and just making sure that we really are open and transparent about the challenges that all of our team members are facing right now. A lot of patience. Thank you so much. Um, if, you know, Mary has another good question here about advancing women in tech. And I would just say, um, I know we all have hard stops at one o'clock. So if people want to continue this conversation with you directly, how would you prefer they reach out to you? Just connect on LinkedIn or what kind of yeah. connections? LinkedIn okay. is fantastic. perfect. Me. Yeah. yeah, Becky too. Okay, perfect. And so Rebecca Fortune and Christian Koontz, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's, you know, just to quickly reflect back a little bit, um, you know, Becky, when you mentioned connection and, and reaching out to people and, you know, learning from others, like that is exactly how I got involved in the Utah Agile community. I was on an island, like experiencing issues that I didn't know how to solve. And so, 
reaching out and, and eventually, you know, becoming kind of part of the leadership team of Utah Agile has been hugely beneficial. And I'm so looking forward to when we can reconvene our uh, ladies lunch, <laughs> our women yeah. in tech lunch that we had started before COVID. So thank you so much again. I really appreciate it.